Hello, my name is Matt Evans from the Department of Chemistry. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the work that we've been doing, looking at the impacts of the global pandemic on the composition of the atmosphere. For most people, the spring this year was spent at home. Lockdown resulted in deserted streets around the world. But in the University of York's chemistry department, it was actually quite busy. Our structural biochemists were trying to understand the chemical structure of the COVID virus, and the Wolfson Atmospheric Chemistry Labs, where I work, was monitoring the impact of lockdown on air pollution. It was obvious that things had changed. We traveled less, went to the office less, went shopping less. The cities were quieter and the skies cleaner. This was gonna have a profound impact on how much pollution we emitted into the atmosphere, but by how much? Was it the same all the way around the world? And what was the impact going to be on climate change? This is obviously a big global question. So we need to work with a big global group of scientists to find the answers. Fortunately, atmospheric science is a friendly community. So we were pretty quickly talking to our colleagues both in Yorkshire and around the world about this problem. Carbon dioxide is the most important climate gas. Most carbon dioxide is emitted by industry, energy generation and road transportation. We've got a pretty good handle on the industry and energy generation sources. In many places around the world, these emissions are routinely monitored, but the pollution emitted by transport sources is harder to measure. Normally this data is built up over years, looking at specifically monitored roads and from traffic camera data. But this is a slow and laborious process. How could we quantify quickly how the COVID restrictions impacted the journeys made in cars and lorries? Many of you will remember these kind of slides from the Downing Street coronavirus briefings. It shows the places people spent their time after lockdown, calculated using information that Google and Apple collected from the location of mobile phones. This shows a huge drop in the time people spent in retail, train stations, and at workplaces as we went into lockdown. This is exactly the kind of information we needed. Together with information collected automatically by power stations and industry, Piers Foster, his daughter at home because of lockdown, and his colleagues at the University of Leeds could estimate how much of the emissions of carbon dioxide would have changed due to COVID lockdown. And it was a lot. This map shows what they thought the changes in the emissions of carbon gases were during the lockdown in April. We can see relatively large changes over Europe and North America, India, Australia, South Africa, South America. But at this point, the lockdown in China had worked and their numbers had come back almost to normal. All of this seems great, but can we verify these emissions in some ways? Are these guesses any good? It's hard to verify emissions of carbon dioxide directly as it lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Any changes that occur over just a few months will have a small impact on its concentration. But we can use the measurements of other air pollutants emitted at the same time as carbon dioxide to test our method. Nitrogen dioxide is a gas produced whenever we burn things at high temperatures, such as inside a car engine or from a power plant. So it's a good indicator of transport and industrial activity. It also hangs around in the air for only a few hours. Any changes in its emissions would be quickly reflected in the concentrations we measure. However, this also leads to a lot of variability. The weather can change concentrations between one day and another by a huge amount, as the winds come from different directions, the sunlight varies and it rains or doesn't. This plot shows measurements of nitrogen dioxide made in North Kensington, London, from 2018 on the left to November 2020 on the right. You can see the big seasonal change with higher concentrations in the winter and lower concentrations in the summer. You can also see spikes in the concentration caused by the changing weather. The lockdown period is shown in blue. Given the seasonal variation and the spikes caused by the weather, it's really hard to see whether there's any systematic reduction in NO2, nitrogen dioxide pollution, during the blue lockdown period. What we need is a way of predicting what the concentration would have been had the COVID restrictions not been in place and compare that to the observations we actually got. 
Normally, we would just use the spring 2019 values with a bit of averaging for this. But what do you remember from the spring lockdown? This was the view from my flat in April, completely blue skies, really unusual for Yorkshire in the springtime. Spring 2020 was a really dry, sunny period. In fact, it was the Met Office say, the sunniest spring on record in the UK, completely unlike 2019. So we can't simply compare the 2020 values with the 2019 values. The weather was too different. So we need to try something else. In modern science, it's always nice to have friends with some big computers when trying to deal with a data problem like this. And NASA has some very big computers. Talking to our friends at NASA, we came up with a plan. Could we predict what the nitrogen dioxide concentration would have been had the COVID restrictions not been in place, taking into account the weather? After some conversations, we trained a machine learning system to predict the nitrogen dioxide concentration in North Kensington based on the observations and information from the NASA Global Air Quality Forecasting Model, GEOS. GEOS can predict the concentrations of air pollution everywhere in the world. It knows about the weather patterns, but it doesn't always get the answers right, as we don't know the emissions of air pollution everywhere perfectly. And we don't know all the chemistry going on in the atmosphere. So we trained a machine learning system to predict the concentrations of NO2 based on the observations made in 2018 and 2019 and the NASA GEOS model. By only training the machine learning on 2018 and 2019, it didn't know anything about the COVID restrictions. But we could then use the machine learning to predict the concentration in 2020 when the restrictions in place. The machine learning didn't know anything about the COVID restrictions as we haven't given it any additional information. So its prediction would be our best guess as to the concentration of nitrogen dioxide you would have had if no restrictions were in place. The black line on the top here are the observations that we saw earlier. And the red line is what we think would have happened without COVID based on the machine learning. Before 2020, the two lines are on top of each other. But after we get to around March 2020, the red line stays pretty high, but the black observations fall away. It's the difference between this red line and the black line, which is the impact of COVID on the NO2 concentration. The bottom panel shows the ratio between the observed and the expected nitrogen dioxide concentration. The red line and the green line, the two vertical dashed lines, shows the stop and start of the lockdown restrictions. In May, the observed nitrogen dioxide was around 50% lower than what we might have expected. The restrictions on travel in central London had quite an impact. So that's all well and good for London, but what we wanted to do is assess how good our predicted emissions were around the world. How do you scale this up to cover the world? Fortunately, very recently, there's been an effort to collect all of the air pollution observations made around the world in real time and make them freely available to anybody. This kind of effort to make scientifically obtained data publicly and freely available to everybody, whether scientists, governments, or public, is a big trend in science. Known as open science, this is making changes in the way we do science. Open data sets allow anybody to do new and creative things with data. In this case, the Open Air Quality Project, or OpenAQ, is trying to collect all of the air pollution observations made around the world into a single publicly available database. Each of the dots here shows a location measuring pollution around the world that reports live into this OpenAQ database. There are around 6,000 sites here. And so we repeated the analysis that we did for North Kensington for each of these 6,000 observational sites, all the sites in the database. This involved us analyzing around 100 million observations across 49 countries. You do need some big computers to do this kind of analysis. We calculated how much the observed nitrogen dioxide changed in each one of the 6,000 sites, and then for each country came up with a value for the average reduction in concentration. Then for each country, we could compare this change to the emissions change predicted from the Google Apple mobility data. And if we compare them, this is what we get. So on the horizontal axis, we have the observed change in the nitrogen dioxide concentration 
based on the machine learning we did with NASA. And on the vertical axis, we have the change in the NO2 emission that Piers Foster and his daughter calculated from the Google Mobility data. And the dashed line shows where we would expect the points to be if everything was perfect. Although the alignment isn't completely perfect, we can see a good correlation between the predicted reduction and those seen. Places like Taiwan, Taipei, where implement, which implemented very small restrictions in response to COVID, saw only small reductions in their nitrogen dioxide emissions. Whereas places like the UK and Italy, which implemented much more robust restrictions, saw much bigger drops. Places like China and India didn't fit so well. And this isn't that surprising. Mobile phones are much less prevalent, and for both countries, our emission statistics are much less good in general anyway. However, overall, this gave us some faith in the emissions that we calculated from nitrogen dioxide using the mobility data, and so gave us some faith in the emissions that we calculated for other compounds like carbon dioxide. So we have confidence in our calculated substantial reductions in the emission of climate gases, but what did this do to global temperatures? To find this out, we ran two climate model simulations, one with emissions that didn't change because of COVID and one where the emissions did change based on the mobility data. We could then compare the surface temperatures to see how big the impact was. And the answer is not very much. We found that although emissions of climate gases came down by up to 40% during lockdown, the impact on global temperatures is really small a reduction of around 0.01 degrees C, an almost unmeasurably small amount. So why is this? Some of it is that processes cancelled out. The decreased emissions of carbon dioxide did lead to a reduced warming of the planet. But some of this was offset by a reduction in the emission of particles into the air. The air was clearer during lockdown because of the fewer particles. This reduced how much of the light from the sun was scattered back into space. So more light fell on the surface of the Earth, and this warmed the planet a little bit more. So there was some offsetting between these two factors. But the biggest problem is the time that carbon dioxide sits around in the air for. Most of the carbon dioxide released from the first steam engines is still in the atmosphere, still warming the planet. Nearly all of the carbon burnt in power stations of the last century is still in the air today. Carbon dioxide is removed rather slowly from the atmosphere. And depressingly, a couple of months of reduced emissions isn't going to make much of a difference compared to a couple of centuries. But there are some positive notes here. Changes that we make to deal with a climate emergency will quickly improve air pollution as we move to massively increase our renewable electricity production for electric cars, electric heating, and electric industry, we should rapidly get cleaner cities and reduce cases of lung and heart disease associated with air pollution. The climate benefits will be slower, but they will be there. It's a win-win situation, but we need to plan for this win-win now. We will need to build back after COVID, and we need to do so with climate and air pollution in mind, Climate is a very long game and we need to be playing it now. The UK has been very successful in replacing the old cold coal power stations with gas and renewables, but we need lots of electricity in the future if we're going to replace the petrol in cars and the gas in our houses. We need to build lots of clean, cheap, renewable electricity now together with mechanisms to store it. The other positive message is that science is a friendly activity and getting friendlier. We're embracing open science policy so data collected by one scientist can be shared around the world, where people can use it in new, unexpected and innovative ways. When a program to archive all of the world's air quality data started, nobody expected us to use it to assess the change in emissions from a pandemic. Similarly, Google and Apple never anticipated us using their mobility data to estimate the emissions of climate gases. Open science, coupled with machine learning, is generating powerful tools for us to understand and improve our world. And this is clear with the COVID vaccine development. Almost as soon as the first cases were reported, the genetic makeup of the virus was openly reported by Chinese scientists. This allowed groups around the world to put together vaccines at an amazingly fast pace. 
open science like this is making the world a better place. I'd like to acknowledge the long-term funding that has allowed us to do this work from the UKRI, Natural Environment Research Council, from the National Centre for Atmospheric Science, and from NASA. Thank you very much. <laughs>